going to be trying to talk a little bit about the history of why do we even call these things sprites? And talk about ways that you can use sprites today. And I'm going to do some demos and a couple different things. So doing demos means that there'll probably be lots of mistakes in front of a live audience. So I guess we'll just see how we do today. All right. Anyway, um, hey, I used to use graph paper. Did you used to use graph paper when you did the sprites? Um, and I guess you could still use graph paper today if you were really into that. But there's a lot of other better things. And uh, I'll show you some of those tools, kind of in some interesting kind of like, how much help do you want? No help at all, all the way to some tools that really do some pretty amazing things. So we'll go through that together. If you were here earlier today, you've probably seen these slides, but uh, yeah, I grew up between Oklahoma City and Dallas, in a really small town. And uh, like uh, millions of other people, got a Commodore 64 in uh, 1983, and that really put me on the, the journey that I brought me to this stage, I guess. Um, after high school, I did serve in the US Army, and then I've uh, been fortunate enough to work for a lot of really interesting companies. And uh, interesting companies that all seem to have teal or blue-colored logos, I don't know why. And uh, yeah, some of the languages that just to, I guess, understand the, the mud that I've walked through, some of the languages that I learned for free, and things that I actually were paid to use, which is kind of cool. All right. I love, these, I love this picture. I showed this picture earlier today, too, because I think uh, I, can, <laughs> I can hear these, these images. I can hear these pictures. I know that sound effect that goes with these screenshots, right? Um, anyway, Atari called it player missile graphics because they know they needed to have games and there would be a player and they'd be shoot, shooting things around. So there was this concept of graphics that were essentially what we call sprites. Um, Texas Instruments, uh, guys working on the, the chip there, well, one of their managers liked the way that these little graphics kind of floated above the text in an eerie kind of way because they were in front of the text, right? So that's where sprites first got their name from uh, a manager at Texas Instruments. So, uh, you know, when the Commodore, uh, they were wanting to work on the, uh, the VIC chip, they grabbed a bunch of computers and they had the TI, they had other things, and they started like, they, all right, here's the competitors. We're going to build one that's better than all the other ones. And we're going to combine, you know, all of these great features. Um, uh, but they didn't call them sprites. They called them uh, managed object blocks, mobs. There's a lot of ar uh, early Commodore documentation that still calls them mobs, but sprites sort of became the industry term and took over. And wow, when they wanted to build a chip that had more features than all the competition, they did. It was amazing, right? You had eight sprites. Or maybe you could get a little more if we did some things, but eight sprites. You could layer them, they had transparency, uh, two different sizes. Can you believe that? You have a 24 by 21 pixel one. That was the high res one. If you wanted a multicolor sprite, it's 12 pixels by 21 pixels. Uh, but at the time, that was pretty amazing. So they put all that in there. Of course, that meant that the Commodore 64 was an amazing game machine. That's probably what attracted so many people for like such a low price point. You could get such high performance. It did graphics at an incredible, incredible way. You couldn't even imagine compared to other things at the time, right? So maybe when you first got your Commodore 64, you played games on it. You had exposure to those graphics, and you're like, I want to do some of those. And as a, you know, a young teenager, you're like, man, sprites are hard. There's all these numbers. What is this binary arithmetic? I don't, this is like, where's the move of the alien around command? Didn't exist, right? This was hard. You had to know a lot of stuff about them too. You had to understand like all these special registers and how they affected them. Programming them was kind of difficult. All right, so let's go through, just through a real quick thing, just some of the basics of like what it was to, to get a sprite onto the screen and, and kind of like uh, a little bit of basic animation stuff. So. Right, the first thing you have to do, right? You recognize that's the same Commodore balloon that was in the programmer's reference guide. That's probably the first sprite most people that had that book started with. And wow, it took a, like, kind of a, a nice little chunk of both code and data to like even get that on the screen, right? 
but that's what we had to do. You had to learn how to do the convert those data statements, and you had to like learn about what these special pokes were, put it on there. And then, because the VIC chip, you know, has a special magic register that says if you know how to put a value in this specific spot, you can move it. So here's like, well, using BASIC, here's two examples of how you can control and make it horizontal move and vertical move. So that's, that's a type of animation. You're, you're moving a, an object on the screen. Um, and it's okay. Now, this is a little bit different, right? So this is this kind of the same code in assembler. And I want to point out something here, and we probably will not talk about it anymore through the rest of the hour. But for now, uh, the red boxes. Basic is slow. The VIC chip is fast, but basic is slow. So if you were to essentially remove the code for the red boxes, all you would see was a white blur going across the screen. The white boxes are actually something that you have to do in assembler to slow it down a little bit. It's actually waiting for uh, the, the, the raster interrupt to come back around to a certain line. And uh, when you don't have in basic, you didn't have to do that, but assembler you do. So that's one reason, I guess, why assembler is the way to go if you want to make anything actually happen. But basic's okay for a lot of things. And so for most of the time, we'll talk about the samples. They'll be in basic. Okay, basic animation. You've seen this, this has been around for hundreds and hundreds of years, right? Basic animation is a flip book. It's a series of images. Each image is a little bit different than the other one. So when you show them real fast to the human eye, it looks like it's moving. I thought that was hilarious. Someone mentioned Frantic Freddy earlier today in another talk. Anyway, we're gonna use the game Frantic Freddy, and I'm gonna talk about how that character is animated. There are four poses. Freddy only has four poses in his motion. And later on, I'm actually gonna show you how I can extract those, and I'll show you the tool to do that. But for now, just realize that Freddy has four, mo four poses. There they are. Now, if you think about the flip books, the same way that I would create four different images, you could make four different sprites and put these four poses into four sprites. And if I wanted to animate it, I could say, let's show sprite number one. Let's move him forward a little bit in the position. We just talked about how you can change the X and Y coordinate of a sprite. I can say, hide the sprite number one, show sprite number two. Hide sprite number two, show sprite number three, and so forth. Seems like that's how animation's done, right? I'm showing something, I'm changing it, so it looks like that. Well, there's a lot of problems. Um, I mean, eight sprites seems like a lot, but you only have eight. In a game like Frantic Freddy, there's a lot of sprites on the screen. So that really isn't a viable option if you wanna have a game with multiple objects on it. And also, even though the VIC chip is really fast, when you're actually taking down a sprite and showing another sprite, it could cause some splicker, flicker, so this really isn't the way that most animation is done. Instead, those magic registers, right? Inside the chip, there is a register that says, where is the data located that I should get this sprite from? And there's lots of places in memory where you can poke these and leave these sprites hanging around. So the way that most of the animation is done is loading up all four of Freddy's poses here and loading them into, you know, these four blocks. This is like the real popular ones, the block one, nine, two, three, four, nine, four, nine, five. And you use one sprite. So you say, let, take that sprite zero. One sprite, point it initially, and say, you're at block one, nine, two. Then to move it, you take that same sprite, change its location a little bit, and tell the VIC chip, oh, you're now pointing at block one, nine, three. Get your data from block 193, and the VIC chip will redraw it, and there you go. Same thing, move to block 194, 195. And that's how most of the animation is done. Not by changing which sprite you're seeing, but changing where the memory is pointed at for that sprite. And you can do a lot of poses, all from a single sprite. And another thing here is you can have 
multiple sprites point to the same memory area. Each sprite does not need to be unique. The little uh, kind of like Oscar the Grouch looking guys that chase Freddy around, there's only, that's only a memory one time. They'll take two sprites and they'll point each of those sprites at the same point in memory, but that's a nice way you kind of conserve a little memory. It's really smooth. All right, back to the regular program. Sprites are full of numbers. They're hard to deal with. You have to know a lot of special things. Luckily, you know, there were sprite editors. Even for, you know, the C128 had one built in. That was cool. But the C64 didn't have anything built in. Uh, but you could buy some, and they were kind of cool. Allowed you to kind of draw on the screen, and it would, like, export the data for you. You could, pop, you know, poke it into memory and get it out of there. You know, it's, it was possible. But... We live in the future. We don't have to use Commodore 64 software to build sprites if we don't want to. So the order kind of, I guess this is sort of ordered in um, the least amount of help to the most amount of help. Because yeah, you could still use paper. This is a product. You could go to Amazon now and buy it if you wanted to. Um, and I, I don't need to say anything bad about Mr. Tony Lavoie, but I don't really understand why this is a product. Um, but yes, you could buy essentially fancy graph paper on Amazon if you wanted to do it like I used to in the 1980s. Excel, people love Excel, Excel's great. Um, you can do sprite design, there are several different, these are two, but there's a whole bunch of different ways. Where you can go into Excel and like, you know, switch some cells to zeros to ones and things like that and it will automatically calculate the data statements for you and you can then copy and paste that into a program. So Excel is a little more help than just paper. But there's tools and all this pixel art, right? Everyone recognizes that block, right? That's a Minecraft block. And you think about finding tools. And there's a lot of tools. There's a lot of tools because of Minecraft and other pixel art games. But you have to be careful because a lot of that art and a lot of those tools are not the right size, not the right amount of color density. So you can be like, oh, this is a great tool or this is a great like, you know, set of graphics. But they're probably going to be like 32 by 32 pixels. They're probably going to use a lot more than 16 colors. So you do have to be a little bit selective, and so watch out if you start looking for tools to make sure that uh, you don't fall into the Minecraft tools kit and uh, can't use them for your 8-bit projects. Anyway, uh, this, is a, this is a tool, SpriteMate. It's completely browser-based, really coded quite well. But it is... Uh, you know, has things you would expect as far as a uh, ability to move an image around so you can create animations. Um, has a great way that you can import different image formats. Um, it does some really interesting things as it tries to take images that are too big and interpolate them and down to smaller images. Um, so uh, just as a demo, like here's the things how you can, you know, shift it left, shift it right. It's, uh, it's actually, uh, you know, pretty handy. It's still in a browser, but it allows you to export in a lot of different ways. You can export that sprite as a graphic. You can also have it uh, generate the uh, basic code for you. This is one that I did the other day and uh, gives you the data statements and even gives you a little uh, set of boilerplate template code to uh, get the sprite on the screen. So yeah, SpriteMate in a browser, pretty easy to use. All right, let's take one more step level up in complexity. Sprite Pad. Sprite Pad has been around. They have a great tool called CharPad that goes along with it. Uh, not free. Not really uh, high cost. It's about eight bucks. Or you can even get a deal if you want to buy both Sprite Pad and CharPad at the same time. Um, this one's been around for a long time and it's kind of considered the, the standard because of uh, all the animation that you can do with it. It's really the tool if you're going to do something and spend a lot of time building your sprites. Um, this is probably the one you heard about. All right, let's do a demonstration. So let's uh, go in and see how uh, well we get through this. Okay, 
This is sort of the sprite pad workspace, workspace here. Now, it ships with a lot of different demos, so I've got some here. Oh, hang on. Oh, man, do I have to like drag that over there? Let me see if I can mirror my displays instead of uh, actually trying to pull it across there. All right, let's do it this way. There, cool, huh? All right, so um, this is the one of the demo sprite sheets that comes with the program. This is from a, a game, and uh, it has a layout sheet. This is a, a sheet because you can essentially, you know, order and put it. There's a whole lot of them in here, right? Um, but you know, the editing is what you'd expect. You can change pixels individually by painting them over here. It's, a, it's very Commodore aware, so it knows that, you know, what your color limitations are. It knows that you are working with multicolors, but it has this really fun thing that I think everybody likes to see, which is let's put all the animations in motion, right? So if I was working on a program and I was trying to figure out how to, uh, you know, do I have the right number of poses? Um, and this one here is also doing something kind of cool, right? These are two sprites. There's a sprite that they stack on top of each other, so they're actually gonna move these two sprites together on the screen and make them move. But I showed you Frantic Freddy, and I showed you uh, we had four poses, so I'm gonna show you what I think is pretty, one of the coolest things about Sprite Pad here. Do you know in the Vice emulator, you can save a snapshot, right? You've got a C64 emulator running, and you can save an exact snapshot of that machine's state to a disk file. So. Let's go here and take a look. There's an import export menu. And under the import export menu, uh, let's see. Make sure everybody can see this. There's something called the emulator snapshot ripper. Okay, the other stuff makes sense, right? I want to import a binary. I want to, you know, import an image, but snapshot ripper? Okay. So, uh, select a snapshot file. And I happen to have a Vice snapshot file here of the Frantic Freddy game that we we're talking about. And so it loads up what is, you know, the common areas that you would expect to have a program storing sprite data into. Video bank one, or zero here. I don't see anything that looks like sprites exactly. But let's look around a little bit more. Video bank two. No, no, definitely not sprites. But video bank one, whoa. Suddenly from that snapshot file, I'm actually seeing from that memory things that look like sprites. Cool. Okay, so let's say, yeah, let's, uh, let's import that. And let's zoom out again. There it is, it created a, a sheet for me of all of my Frantic Freddies. Now I'm having some trouble here, right? The screen, it doesn't look quite like Frantic Freddy. He was a different color. Uh, so it gives you, you know, it gives you some options here so I can say, okay, um, everything is that brown, my background color needs to be black. Uh, everything that was green, I think that was uh, the pink. And I think these guys, um, were white, and then that was red, and there's the Frantic Freddy that you just saw on the screen. And you can take him, and uh, like I said, you can see all his poses right there. And you also see that there are the same four poses going the other direction. And there's a couple of poses of him jumping, sliding, and uh, falling down. Cool, huh? Uh, anyway, so that's a way uh, silly easy that you can take any game that you can run in Vice and save a snapshot and then extract the graphics out of it and do anything you want to with it. So anyway, that's Sprite Pad Pro. Let's go find the presentation again. All right. So as we go up the level of like things that are going to help you, tools that are going to help you. I want to talk about the CBM PRG Studio and uh, huge fan, a huge fan of this tool. 
Um, been around for a while. It's, uh, he updates it about twice a year, but it's been around since 2011. It's free, which is great. It's not open source. I don't know why he won't release that. Um, it's also built on the Microsoft.NET framework, which means that you uh, have to be able to run .NET. Uh, works best on Windows. Um, so I got support for every Commodore 8-bit machine. Uh, you can see the list of the VIC, uh, all the plus four, the Mega 65, all the pets. Um, it's a very great tool. Why do you want to use it? Um, wow, this is just a short list of some of the features, right? It's got Git integration. It's got a sprite editor, which I'm going to show you. It's got a character editor, a screen designer. I'm going to show you the screen designer. Uh, a SID tool, if you're really into the music. I'm not really good at music, but I've heard it's great. Um, uh, the memory viewer, ways to move program code in and out. Code formatting, if you use it as an integrated development environment, it's got really great code formatting tools. Um, you can renumber code, uh, ways to, uh, you know, auto code formatting. It's uh, what you would expect today as a full feature development environment. I mean, this is some code, some kind of showing off some of the different things for like syntax highlighting, white space, indenting. Uh, you can do all these things, and then when it processes it down, it will you know, pull out all that stuff. So that what it actually sends to the machine is just uh, what it knows how to expect, which is the raw uh, code. The screen editor. Oh, man. I used to, I bet you probably did too. I used to like just have a fresh, clean Commodore 64 screen, and I would be drawing uh, Petsky graphics in the middle of the screen, then I have to go back up to the top and like write line numbers and print quote. 20 print quote, 30 print quote, to like capture something that I've drawn. Um, there's a screen editor, makes it really easy so you can put together and draw something, able to export it and put it into your code. We're gonna actually see that in the demo. There's a sprite editor, not as full and rich as SpritePad Pro, but it really does some amazing things. And I'm gonna show you that one too. All right, let's get on with the rest of the demo. Uh, I built a little program called Bill in Spriteland. He's neither Freddy, he's neither Mario, but he's somewhere in between. All right. I think that font needs to be bigger. Let's make that a little more readable. So let's go in here. Uh, options. There's a ton of options, as you can see, and then one of them is for the font. And so let's make that font, oh, let's try something a little bit bigger. Let's maybe make it an 18-point font, see if that's readable enough. Well, I don't think that's big enough again. Let's try this again. Maybe I'll leave the magnifier off this time so I can uh, make the navigation quicker. All right. Eh, that still doesn't seem quite right. What am I messing up here? This is the, what I was talking about when we're going to do the live, de live demo and see if I can uh, get it right. So I was going to fonts, that's that. Oh, it's the memory preview one. I'm, I'm not changing, I gotta change the source font. There we go. There you go. Hopefully that's the, the, the worst of our challenges uh, doing the demo. Oh, okay, now we're talking. Everybody can see that, even way back in the back. All right, so um, first of all, there's a, uh, you know, what you might not expect for a Commodore project, there's a, a, a project explorer. There's structure. There's structure to this project, and you can have uh, multiple basic files. It can organize if you have assembly files. Uh, I've got multiple sprites here, some screen designs. It's uh, all together here in this tool. So, all right, so the code. What I'm uh, starting with, just to save us all a bunch of time, is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm doing this in basic so it's, everybody can understand it, and I'll make it available after. It's a, it's a good starting point. It's essentially a way that's going to show an introduction screen, and then we're going to uh, load up some sprite data, and then I've got a little short little bit of game routine here 
that uh, you know sets all the, the multicolor sprites up, uh, makes them, we're, we're gonna expand him one dimension, not two. Um, I'm using only that sprite zero and I have a way that I'm kind of defining the way that I want him to walk, those animation poses in an, an array. And then based on pwn how the keyboard, whether I'm hitting the right cursor or the left cursor, it's a little animation routine that runs. All right, and let's get started looking at something else. So the first thing you see here, I've got a placeholder for the sprite data. So I'm gonna go into the sprite editor and I have There he is, there's Bill. And you can see that uh, inside here, I can choose where I want to expand in both directions or none. So I can get a little bit of a uh, preview of what he's gonna look like, change the colors, and there's multiple sprites that are actually in this file. So I've got the main position here with him standing. Um, oh, I have the first step if he's going to the right, the middle step, and then a last step, but that's only the right facing one. And you saw with Freddy, I need to have kind of like the right facing ones. And you could probably do this programmatically, but it's really hard and I'm gonna need the left facing ones. So using this tool, let's see how we're gonna do that. Uh, so if I go back to the very first one, it was him standing looking right. So I can copy that. I can add a new sprite to my collection. Now I have five. And then I want to paste that. All right, so I have a, you know, I have a copy of him looking to the right. That's not what I want. I want him looking to the left. Well, look at all these other buttons here. I can uh, flip him. I can flip him up and down. All right, if I was going to do that same Freddy thing where it looks like he's falling on his head, but that's not what I want. Um, you can shift him up or shift him down. If you're trying to make a motion of something, you know, melting or whatever, this is a really good way that you can manipulate one image into others. But I really want to flip him, right? Boom, he's facing left now. Done. All right, let's go back and uh, the second pose was a right first step. Same thing. Copy this one. That gives me a new one pasted in there and I want to flip him. There you go. There's my left first step. All right, we've got to do this two more times and we'll be in business. All right, now the right middle step, copy that. New sprite in the array. Paste him in, flip it. And I'll show you why. I, why am I keep on updating these little descriptions, huh? I'll show you that in a second too. All right, last one, and then we can move on, which is the right last step. Copy, new one, go to number eight here, paste that one in, and flip him over, and there we go. All right, something I wanna show you down here is this preview. Um, the preview is actually for animation. So if I want to go through an animation that uh, I have eight sprites in this, in this uh, set. Doesn't really make sense to do all eight though. So I'm gonna do one through four because the, the first four are what really define the, uh, the motion. Ooh, hang on. Starting at one, why is it doing that? It's like uh, skipping some steps here. Oh wait, I know why. See one, let's take that off. Two, three, four. All right, there we go. Let's make this, I bet this will work now. I should be able to see his uh, animation. There you go. Kind of shows the rough way that Bill kind of dances as he walks. If I want to see the other way, I've set, uh, I want to see uh, sprite number five through sprite number eight. Oh, it's doing it again. You know, I gotta go through there, because some of them are set to be ex vertically expanded and some aren't. Well, I'm not gonna mess with that right now. All right, so, um, got him. 
they're in the program, right? I've got access to them, but uh, I need to export them. So my choices for exporting, I can export it to a listing, to memory, I can export it to a binary file. Um, let's do to a listing. My options, yeah, I wanna do basic data. I think I wanna start at line 1000. I've already forgotten where I left where I was at. Let me go back and look at that. Uh, yeah, I want sprite data starting at line 1000. Okay, there we go. File, export to a listing, starting at line number 1000. How do I want my line numbers to increment? Yeah, let's do it by 10. Um, if you want really dense, you can do it six. You could do it even larger. Uh, let's leave it at six. And um, say, do I want to generate data for all of these eight sprites? Or do I want to just do a subset of them? I'm going to say, yeah, do it for the all eight, because I need all eight. And then, that is that. Let me zoom back out again. So now, starting at 1,000 there, where I was, it just generated all this code for me. It did all the calculations, it put everything in here. And there's those descriptions I was talking about. So if I'm trying to figure out where each one begins and which one ends, you can see that it put your uh, rem statements in there for those spots. So yeah, there you go. There's all the data that I needed for those eight sprites generated for me and inserted into my program. Cool. Okay, so I got one loading screen I've already done in here to save us some time. But let's look at the screen designer because I need to get the rest of the play area um, going here. So in those screen designs, I've got the, uh, the intro screen here. That's the one I've already done and generated for us. And I've also got one here for the play area. So the screen designer is kind of handy. You got the grid here where I can, uh, you know, select essentially a brush and what tool I want to paint in. There's a nice little, uh, you know, pesky character map that's going to be handy. Um, some ways you can actually, if you're going to be repeating something or you've got something that's a custom character set, you can load it in here. But I think I want to add a little more sunshine to this. So I want to get some yellow character color. And let's take some of these guys here and let's make a little, I don't know, let's put a sunshine up here. So I'm just clicking and it's essentially drawing with the character that I've got selected there. So there, that's what my screen looks like. Now the same way that the tool allowed me to export those sprites and export those sprites as code, I can do this with these, uh, this screen as well. Oh, hang on, I lost it with my uh, magnifier. There we go. Oh, I went off it again. Okay, so file. You can export it as basic, assembler. You could actually export this as a graphic. Interesting enough. Let's say I wanna export it to basic. Same thing about how I can control what that code looks like and where my starting line numbers are. I do want to start at line 20,000 and generate that. It will generate it up here, give you a preview of it. You can see it's doing some special things to handle the pet ski because this editor uses ASCII, not pet ski, so that's gotta do some magic here for how it uh, you know, in interprets those. Anyway, yeah, let's copy this uh, code it just generated to the clipboard, close it, go back to the code. And I got this on the clipboard, so I'm going to just paste it, do a control V here, and paste that into the code. Now I'm also gonna do something else here to make our lives a little easier, uh, which is I need to be able to not have it roll over to on the last line. So I'm just gonna make a, put a semicolon right there so that controls it. All right, so there we go. So with the tool, we just went and uh, generated the sprites by flipping them around, exported it all to the code here. We did the same thing with the screen design. Um, let's run it. Now this is where you really should be placing your bets to say I've just been you know, copying and pasting things. What are the chances this will actually run the first time? I don't know, that's so. 
Anyway, so I've already associated uh, a vice emulator here, so I'm gonna say, uh, you know, build this, uh, build this program and let's run it. If I had build errors, they actually pop up here in the output and it'll tell me, so if it has something it can't do, there I am into the emulator. There's the loading screen. Now, because it's in basic, I got all that data. It actually takes a bit here for me to convert those data statements and load it into those eight sprites. The four sprites have been facing one way and the four the other. Oh, I know what I did. You know what I, did anybody else figure out what I did wrong? Yes, I generated all that code, but I never returned, so I just like drew my screen and it was done. So let's go 20, uh, 30, let's return off that. All right, let's try it one more time. Oh, I'm gonna do that. All right, gotta wait for the basic program to generate, load through all that uh, data again. Ah, there it is, there's the sunshine we're just looking at. I'm gonna use my cursor keys to the right, my cursor keys to the left, and there's Bill and his adventure in Spriteland. How easy was that, huh? Okay, well, we're almost wrapped up here. I do wanna make mention of a couple books that I found really helpful when I was a kid, and I even referred back to them a little bit when I started building this presentation. Um, two pretty amazing books if you wanna check those out. Anyway, what did you, uh, really, feel free, download the tools. Download the Excel files if you wanna use Excel to create sprites, that's fine. Um, anyway, I highly recommend the CBM PRG Studio, it's great stuff. Uh, if you start looking and you start to Google something, look for something called Sprite Sheets. Sprite Sheets are gonna be what we saw in the uh, SpritePad Pro, where it's got a whole lot of different poses. You can find a lot of great stuff out there. Watch out for the Minecraft ones though. If you find ones that are like the 32 by 32, you're gonna have to deal with that. Anyway, I, I just encourage you to continue using these tools. Uh, you can be much more effective uh, with, you know, by using some of these new modern IDEs. Anyway, that's all I had. So thanks for listening, everybody. All right. Luckily, I st we still have a little bit of time if we have any questions and I want to talk about it. All right. Cool. Well, thanks, everybody. I will see you around the show.